Okay, so I think this is my fifth lecture on the muscular system. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about um, how do you uh, Im improve muscle strength and, and the growth of individual muscles, um, how you train for strength versus endurance, and then we're going to talk about the actual physiology of muscle contraction. Okay, um, this is going to be the last lecture last class lecture so uh i have posted already on google classroom the powerpoint completely without me talking and then this lecture will be added in all right so strength training um if you're an athlete who what kind of athlete would would need to okay so maybe a weightlifter definitely because they need short bursts of strength but then like if you're in a certain sport, um, if you are in track, a, a short distance runner, a sprinter, um, a, a long jumper, they train for strength. They will have bigger, bulkier muscles. Um, this would be maybe um, a, a lineman in football. That would be training for strength. Because for strength training, you just have, um, you want to have larger muscles so that each muscle can have more power. How, do, how is this achieved? This is achieved because you're increasing the diameter or the size of each individual muscle cell. Let me make it clear to you that the number of muscle cells that you have in your body is genetically determined. And through training and through exercise, you are not changing the number, number of muscle cells that you have. You still have the same number of muscle cells. What causes the bulking up or the increase in the size of a muscle cell is caused by the muscle tension being placed on the muscle cell. And so an increase in muscle tension leads to an increase in protein synthesis. Okay, an increase in protein synthesis within the muscle. And that increase in protein synthesis is going to increase the diameter of the muscle. because you've increased the number of myofibrils. So let me remind you what a myofibril is. Within a whole muscle, you have bundles of muscle fibers. And within a muscle fiber, remember that's a muscle cell, okay? Within a muscle fiber, you have the myofibrils, which are the actin and myosin units. Okay, question? It can be on any page, any right hand page in your notebook, wherever it fits. Probably we're getting towards the last page because I had designated the last page to be for muscle contraction. So we're kind of about there. But let it flow. And, and as long as it's on a right-hand page in your notebook, okay? Thank you. A lot of times trainers, um, personal trainers will talk about how in order to grow the, the size of your muscles, you have to tear your muscles. And that's absolutely not true. That's an incorrect, damaging a muscle is not the stimulus that makes a, a muscle grow in size, okay? Think of it this way. If you're damaging a muscle, okay, if you're damaging a muscle, the muscle is definitely going to repair itself, okay? If you're causing little, they'll talk about micro tearing, tearing at a microscopic level, and that's not what's happening, okay? Those micro tears, while they do occur, your body's going to repair them, but it's gonna repair what you already have. An increase in the diameter of a muscle, hypertrophy, is 
a result of your body synthesizing more actin and myosin and building up the diameter of the muscle, putting those myofibril units parallel to each other, okay, parallel. So the more myofibrils you stack, can you see how that would make the muscle thicker and bigger? Damage to a muscle, tearing of a muscle is not going to accomplish that. It's not going to stimulate the muscle to make more. The muscle is going to be stimulated to repair what was already there. Um, they're not, uh, the articles that I've read, they're not really quite sure exactly, but in some way, um, the muscle tension, the primary mechanism of muscle tension, which, which puts a metabolic stress on the muscle, is um, what signals the process of protein synthesis. It signals it at a molecular level. And it, it's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be somehow there's a molecule that's released when the muscle's working extra hard that is going to turn on a gene in the DNA because the cell has a nucleus, it has DNA, and that gene is going to say, oh, we need more actin and myosin units. And, the, and then you're going to have pumping out of those protein units. I think it's pretty, pretty amazing. I, I read a couple of articles and, and they were very, very, uh, very interesting. Okay. So by putting the, your muscle under a mechanical stress, it, the muscle will over time build my, more myofibril units as a response to needing to be able to move a heavier weight, a heavier uh, mechanical stress. Yeah. Question. Okay, you don't know what I mean by the stuff that's written in black. Okay, so if you increase muscle tension, meaning if you put more mechanical stress on a muscle, you're working a muscle group by lifting a weight, okay? If you increase the weight that you're trying to lift, because when you're trying to build muscle, you do heavier weights, fewer repetitions, okay? That stimulates the synthesis of protein inside of your muscle, actin and myosin, okay? So it's like a domino effect. One thing leads to another thing. So more stress on the muscle, more muscle proteins are gonna be made. The more muscle proteins you make, the larger the diameter of your muscle because you have more myofibril units that are here parallel to each other. So it's gonna make the muscle, each muscle fiber is gonna get bigger. Each muscle cell is gonna get bigger. Do you get more muscle cells? No, because the number of muscle cells that you have is determined by your DNA. Can some people just naturally build bigger muscles? Yes, because they may have a different number of muscle cells and so their bodies build muscle more easily. So, you know, not everybody's body, just like your, the number of fat cells you have in your body is genetically determined. When you get fat, are you getting more fat cells? No, each fat cell is getting larger. When you lose weight and you lose fat, each fat cell gets smaller because you're using up the oil inside. It's the same idea, all right? Better? Okay. So, if you're trying to, to train for strength, you need to do heavier weights, fewer repetitions. This would be your sprinter, your lineman. On our chickens and our turkeys, when you did your extra credit, you found this type of muscle in the breast. This was the white meat. Because this was good for quick bursts of power. Because a chicken and a turkey, while they can fly, they only fly for short bursts. So they need that really powerful muscle, but they can't flap over and over again. They can't do short burst after short burst after short burst because they don't have the endurance muscle, which on a bird is your dark meat. Okay? Do we have light meat and dark meat? No, we don't. So the way that we create the type of muscle that we need is by the type of training that we do. When we do endurance training, we're increasing the vasculature 
the blood vessels to our muscles to deliver oxygen, to be able to deliver oxygen to our muscle cells. Because as long as we can keep supplying oxygen to our muscle cells, we can keep burning glucose and we can keep making ATP. It's when our muscles run out of oxygen that they fatigue. So the better the blood vessel support, the longer our muscles can go. This is why we call this aerobic training. So when we're doing aerobic training, we are not going to be lifting weights. We are gonna do our, our training where we're working out for uh, a lighter weight, more repetitions, pushing our muscles to the point of fatigue over and over again, not because we're lifting something heavy, but because of consistent use over and over again. This would be our track athlete who runs the 800 meter, our cross country runner, our wide receiver, okay? These are our athletes that have long, lean muscles and don't look really bulky. Now, in truth, we are a mixture of, you know, fast twitch and slow twitch muscles. Fast twitch, which one would be the fast twitch muscles? Would it be the strength or the endurance? Strength. Strength, because they give us really powerful response and our endurance muscles would be the slow twitch because they're slow to fatigue. It doesn't mean that they're not strong. They can just go for a longer period of time. Where would we find this type of muscle on our chicken or our turkey? The Where would we, we said we, the strength was in the breast meat because they had short bursts of energy. Where would we find the their legs and the thighs. That's the dark meat on our chicken and our turkey because they're foraging on the ground. And so they have to scratch and walk around. And so they have that endurance. You, you don't want them to get tired and like, oh, my legs are tired. No, they have to keep going. Now it's interesting on a bird that is a migratory bird that migrates like a duck or a goose, you kind of have a, a, a a, a reverse. You have dark meat on your breast muscles. Why would you have dark meat there? Why would you have the endurance muscle for a duck or a goose? What does migration mean? They fly for a long time. So they need muscle that's not there for strength, but there for endurance. So it has to be able to go for long periods of time. So in, in slow twitch muscle, in dark meat, somebody, do you remember the name of the protein that makes that muscle darker? Myoglobin, very good. Myoglobin is the protein that we have that actually colors. Now we have myoglobin too, it's just not you know, we don't have dark meat and white meat. So, you know, if you ever eat a human, don't be disappointed. All right, this next section, I'm not going to spend any time on it in, in lecture. Okay. You can group lists of muscles, and this could be something that you could copy or do something else with your notes that are meaningful to you. I have already assessed you on the names of the muscles, but that doesn't mean there won't be things that come up on the test. Um, types of movements. We've already gone through flexion and extension when we did the skeletal system, okay? These are kind of paired up in opposite of each other. Abduction and adduction, okay? Um, rotation, which would be like around a ball and socket joint is where we can have rotation. Okay, so then we have pictures, flexion, and extension. Okay, flexion and extension. 
abduction and adduction, rotation. Then pronation and supination. This is a new term. Supination, if you're standing in anatomical position and your hands, your palms are forward, it's like a bowl and you would pour soup in a bowl. So supination is the palm forward and then pronation is the reverse, palm down. Okay, dorsiflexion, toe up, plantar flexion, toe down. You're gonna use two different muscles for this. You're gonna use the tibialis anterior muscles for dorsiflexion. So if you pull your toe up right now, you can feel that the front part of your shin, the muscle there, pops out and gets firm. When you point your toe, that's your gastrocnemius, pulling on the Achilles tendon to point your toe so your gastrocnemius, your calf muscle should get firm. Inversion. This is when at the ankle, which has some flexibility, but not a lot, but this is where you would point your, the bottom side of your foot inwards, okay? So your big toe would come up and in. That's inversion. Eversion, your big toe points down and the sole of your foot is pointing laterally. And this is how when I fell and broke my ankle, this is how my dislocation occurred. Because when I came down on my right foot, it wasn't flat. It was in an eversion type of position. And so the sole of my foot, my, my leg bent like that, and there was the sole of my foot that way. So it was like that. And the end of my tibia, okay, was poking almost completely through my skin there. And you have your tibia and your fibula comes down like this. Um, I broke this crushed this end of the bone here, crushed this end of the bone there, and then the back side of the tibia, there is another uh, protrusion there, and I crushed that. Question? So what's worse, like an inversion or, or? Any dislocation is bad, bad news. I, I wouldn't say one is better than the other. It's the degree of damage. So while, um, just like different Fractures, some are not as bad as others. A, a dislocation is bad. One thing I did have going for me is that there is a syndesmosis, which is a, an immovable joint um, between my tibia and my fibula, and that was not damaged, thankfully. If that had been torn, then I would have had another whole situation going on. If the bone had been a compound fracture and broken through the skin, then I would have had more complications because of that, because of infection. So because the bone was crushed, it's called a commuted fracture, they um, put a, a couple of pins in. Um, on this side, they, on the inner side, Okay, so this is your, you know, your, it's called the medial malleolus, the, the lump of bone on the inside of your ankle. They put one pin in going like this, or it's not a pin actually, it's a screw. And um, they were gonna put two in. I read the doctor's notes, it was interesting. Um, they started to put two in, but because the bone was crumbling, they had to, they could only get one in and then they had to pull out chunks of bone because it was just, all little bits and pieces that wouldn't what would happen is if they didn't pull out those chunks of bone is the bone would die and then I'd have necrotic tissue inside which was bad and then on the outside I have a long incision and they put in a plate and I can actually feel it and I can count the screws it had holes in it and it's got five screws so they put in a plate on the outside and five different screws and I can feel it one two three four five I can count them on the outside yeah. I dislocated my shoulder like last year and it keeps popping out. So how come it never like healed the 
Okay, well remember, connective tissue, so you dislocated your shoulder and it keeps popping out. So, did you do physical therapy? Okay, so so what's happened is, okay, you've damaged your ligaments that hold your bones together, right? And all connective tissues have a very poor blood supply. And so you've stretched things out and they can't shorten on their own. So the only way you have to strengthen that is through physical therapy and strengthening the muscles of your shoulder so that the musculature pulling on the tendons can help to hold your shoulder in place. Yeah. But it is going to continue to be your Achilles heel, quote unquote, for the rest of your life because it's, it's like, you know, a, a piece of elastic that's been stretched too far and it can't, it can't go back. So now you've got this too much rotation, too much flexibility in that joint. And so if you move it a certain way, it pops out really easily. You just had me work the muscles around me. Well, yeah, because those, so, but that's what, that's the only thing you can do. So if you didn't complete your physical therapy, if you didn't do your exercises, then that's why your arm hasn't healed. Well, I would just, yeah, I would keep doing it, then I would just pop on again, I'll be back at school. Yeah. Well, maybe you're going back to your sport too soon before things have had a chance like, to heal. I would just be, like, like I said, I'd just be swimming, and then it'll pop out, I'll sneeze. <laughs> it'll sneeze and it pops out. It completely dislocates or? It just, like, yeah. Yeah, that's because that joint is just, I mean, you'll probably end up having surgery. Now, you know, you probably have to have surgery to surgically go in and tighten things up and correct things, and then you're probably going to develop tears and things like that. If you develop that and then you have wear and tear on the joint, the ball and socket joint, then you're looking at a, a replacement, a joint replacement. But, oh, my gosh, they're doing so much. They now, now people leave the hospital the day they get a new hip. They're walking the day they get a new hip, you know, and they go in and they put in a, a, a tiny, you know, just a few inches wide um, incision. It's amazing what they can do now. So I would say you need to continue to do your exercises to continue to keep those muscles strong to hold, you know, it's not a, a one and done. And physical therapy is hard to keep up with. They probably gave you resistant, resistance bands and you probably still have those resistance bands somewhere in your room. I don't know, maybe bring them out and do some, you know, training. Okay, so okay, so <laughs> now you know you don't have gelatin in between your bones. Yeah. What were they saying that you had in between your bones? Gelatin? No, they were saying, but what did they mean? I know, but it's not gelatin. They were saying gelatin, but it's not. Your bones weren't fully formed. You still had your epiphyseal plate wasn't sealed yet. So you still had the growth plate. So they were saying gelatin, but now you know it's not gelatin. Your, cart your bones still had that cartilage, yeah. and so your bones weren't done growing yet. Well, I, I mean, I, I don't know how they necessarily can say you're going to be six yeah, foot, but you know, typically once a girl starts menstruating, She's about at her maximum height. You grow, uh, you grow after you menstruate a little bit, but after, after you begin menstruating, you're, you don't have major, major growth spurts. So the only way to know if you were done growing is to look at your long bones and your legs and to see if your epiphyseal plates were sealed. Okay, all right. Wow. Um, anyways, that was my ankle fracture and dislocation and um yeah it's fun now i'm having all kinds of other issues in my leg the same leg the same leg 
because I'm limping and so now I'm having some tendon issues, um, well, actually ligament issues with my quadriceps muscles. Yeah. Uh huh. Yes, it does. Okay, so the plate's made out of what? Metal. Metal. What happens to metal when it gets cold? It gets it gets really cold, right? And it stays cold. So now you have this cold thing inside of your nice warm body, stimulating nerve endings, and you get a, an ache. It aches. Well, it's you have remember you have nerves all over inside of your bones, right? So, you know, that cold is transferred to, to the bone and it causes achiness. So, does your body like attach to the. Um, no, the, the, your body doesn't. It's not a material that the body can grow into. It can sometimes, you know, like grow around it, but they could go in and take the screws and the plate out, and sometimes they have to because the screw and the plate sometimes can. Once the, that was there to hold my bone together, um, all those little pieces to hold them together so that they would grow back to each other. Now, I don't need the screw and the plate in there, but if it's in there and it's not causing me problems, then why not leave it in? Um, according to my orthopedist, they only have to go in about 10% of the time and remove the hardware. And you know, now my ankle is like super, super strong in that place. If my leg were to break, it would break not there again, it would break like above it. Because my bone alone is weaker than the bone with the plate. No, they, they wouldn't change the metal. If I started having problems, they would just go in, make a little incision, and take the metal out. Which, you know, my, my um, screw on the inside of my ankle does hurt. Can I run? I, I don't think so. I haven't tried because now I'm psychologically so freaked out about falling that... I usually go downstairs one stair at a time. If it's dark, I'll take my phone out and use it like a flashlight. I mean, psychologically, the PTSD from that ankle injury, it's been a year and a half and I'm still. I, if, I, if I walk up to stairs, I'm at the top of stairs and if it's, if it's kind of dark, I get scared. All right, um, sorry about that sidetrack there. A lot of good questions. Um, so this slide here is just a review showing you the breakdown of a muscle. When you take a muscle as a whole, um, each muscle is bundled into fascicles and within each fascicle, there are multiple muscle cells, muscle fibers. And when you look at an individual muscle fiber, each muscle fiber has multiple myofibrils in it. Okay, and those myofibrils are composed of those thick filaments and those thin filaments. So I really like this flow chart here where it goes muscle, fascicle, muscle fiber, myofibrils, thick and thin filaments. This shows you the breakdown from largest, most complex structure down to individual structure. I really recommend that you um, write it in words, but then also um, here we're in the diagram, we're like teasing out and going from large to simplest okay and what we're going to be talking about when we look at how a muscle contracts we're going to be looking at it at the filament level but you need to understand that this is um, magnified into an entire muscle contraction you know a million fold because within each muscle cell there's lots of muscle filaments and you see how they're arranged not two-dimensionally but three-dimensionally in space so that's how an entire muscle cell will contract because all of its filaments inside are contracting. Okay, so these are just diagrams from various sources because I like to give you different diagrams to look at so you don't just get caught up that, oh, this is how it looks in just one way. You know, I want you to see it from different artists' interpretations. 
okay? You have a diagram like this on the worksheet that I gave you where you're supposed to color and label. And I want you to notice here that we have some terms like sarcolemma. And the sarcolemma is the same thing as the plasma lemma or the cell membrane. You have a term here called sarcoplasmic reticulum. That is specific in a muscle cell, but it means endoplasmic reticulum. Okay. We have these transverse tubules, which transverse, they go in a cross-sectional way into the interior of the muscle cell. This is one muscle cell, okay, that we're looking at here. And these transverse tubules are there so that you can get the cell membrane well into the interior of the muscle cell. And you're gonna see in a second why that's important. The sarcoplasm is just the cytoplasm. Notice there are mitochondria and there's a nucleus, okay? Because this is a cell, okay? So this is a repeat. We already talked about this the other day. And we're gonna talk about why calcium and ATP is imperative. We must have it in order for muscles to contract. The two-dimensional microscopic structure here shows the actin filaments, which are going to be sliding um, over, being pulled over the myosin. Remember, the actin is the thin filament. The myosin is the thicker filament. And when a muscle contracts, Notice the position of the actin and the myosin relative to each other. During maximal contraction, look at the distance between the Z lines. The Z lines are closer to each other and you have more overlap between the actin and the myosin. Look, which one moves? The actin or the myosin? The actin. So the myosin shown here in green forms what's called cross bridges, grabbing the actin and pulling the actin in, okay? That's how muscles contract, okay? So here we have um, one sarcomere. These little knobby structures on your myosin, those are called myosin heads, and that's what connects forming the cross bridges. So there are step-by-steps of this, but in a nutshell, Here's what happens, okay? Your motor nerve sends a stimulus and a an neurotransmitter is released called acetyl acetylcholine. Acetylcholine bonds with the surface of the muscle cell. And it creates a wave of sodium ions flowing across the cell membrane. That stimulates the sarcoplasmic reticulum to release calcium. Calcium bonds to this protein called troponin. Troponin is on the surface of the actin fiber. When troponin changes its shape because calcium is bonded to it, tropomyosin, which is a long protein, Tropomyosin moves. Tropomyosin is covering up some myosin binding sites. Myosin binding sites. Okay, so the calcium changes shape, causing the, I'm sorry, the calcium bonds to the troponin, the troponin changes shape, and the tropomyosin is then pulled away from the actin binding sites. And here, right here, these little dark circles, those are the actin bi binding sites, the myosin binding sites. What does that do? When the myosin binding sites are revealed, the head of the myosin attaches. What does that do? And these are just pictures reviewing, okay? What does that do? It causes, so here we have um, the myosin head bonding, okay? 
And when the cross bridge attaches, okay, you have a power stroke or a working stroke where the myosin head pulls on the actin. It's going to stay attached until ATP makes it let go. And this is why, give me two seconds, people, two seconds. This is why when you die, you go into rigor mortis. Within 12 to 24 hours, you guys can give me a minute. Within 12 to 24 hours, your body stops making ATP. When your body stops making ATP, your muscles stay in that contracted state. After 24 hours, your muscles begin to decompose. But for about 12 hours, you have enough glucose and oxygen left in your muscles that they can, there's still enough ATP for them to be letting go. So what, no, you're not alive. Those muscle cells, so some of them are alive. Okay, so what I want you to do, use this list, make some flashcards of these steps. Don't number them, shuffle them up, and then see and practice and put them in order, okay? All right, bye.